This video was brought to you by CuriosityStream, which is, just for this week, at its cheapest price ever of $11.59 a year. Get access to bonus TLDR content and all our videos and podcasts ad-free by signing up for the CuriosityStream Nebula Bundle. It's linked below. On Saturday, Australians went to the polls to elect their 47th parliament in what was essentially a two-horse race between Anthony Albanese's Labour Party and incumbent Scott Morrison's Liberal National Coalition. While Labour had enjoyed a steady lead going into the election, polls suggested the race tightened in the days before the election, with the third-placed Green Party seeing a late surge in the polls. So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the race itself, the results, and what all this means for Australia in the future. So, before we get into yesterday's results, a bit of context. For most of its democratic history, Australia has been a two-party state, with elections fought between the centre-left Labour Party and the centre-right Liberal National Coalition, otherwise known simply as the Coalition. This is partly because it's hard for third parties to break through Australia's majoritarian electoral system, which is annoyingly complicated. Australia's parliament is based on the UK system, which means it has two chambers, the upper chamber, which is called the Senate, and the lower chamber, which is called the House of Representatives. The Senate has a total of 76 senators, and the House of Representatives has a total of 151 representatives. Like the House of Commons in the UK, the House of Representatives is the main legislative chamber, and a government only has to command the confidence of the House of Representatives. But the Senate has more political power than its UK equivalent in the House of Lords. For example, it has the power to reject budget and appropriation bills, unlike the House of Lords, and is probably best understood as something in between the House of Lords and the US Senate. Anyway, the main thing you need to know is that the House of Representatives is the main legislative chamber, and that's where parties need to win a majority if they want to form a government. Every election, all 151 representatives are elected via a majoritarian preferential system in single-member districts. What this basically means is that voters rank all the candidates on the ballot in order of preference, and if no candidate wins an outright majority of first preference votes, then the candidate who won the fewest first preference votes is discounted, and the second preference vote redistributed. This process is repeated until one candidate achieves a majority, and then they win the seat. This might sound a bit complicated, but in practice it's essentially majoritarian, which means it disadvantages smaller parties. For example, the Australian Greens won just one seat in the lower chamber last election, despite winning over 10% of the popular vote, largely because their vote wasn't sufficiently concentrated in enough constituencies. Representatives serve three-year terms, which means that Australia holds elections every three years. Senators, on the other hand, serve six-year terms, which means that usually only half the Senate seats are up for grabs at a general election. The exception here is a double dissolution, which is usually when an election is triggered by a dispute between the upper and lower houses. Unlike representatives, senators are elected via a proportional system, single transferable vote, across eight multi-member constituencies. There are 12 senators for each of Australia's six states, and two from each of the two autonomous internal Australian territories the Australian Capital Territory, and the Northern Territory. Because the Australian Senate uses a far more proportional electoral system than the House of Representatives, it's very rare for a government to have a majority in both houses. And this hasn't happened since the coalition won a hefty majority under John Howard in 2005. Anyway, the last election in 2019 was won by the coalition, led by Scott Morrison, who eked out a victory with 41% of first preference votes and a slight 77-seat majority. Since taking power, the coalition's popularity has waned somewhat. Despite a relatively good showing over the pandemic, the government has been beset by successive scandals and is now struggling with inflation and rising interest rates. Morrison himself is pretty gaff-prone, as evidenced on Wednesday when he knocked over a child at an election campaign event. Nonetheless, this doesn't mean that Labour are super popular themselves. Their leader, Anthony Albanese, is pretty gaff-prone himself, 
and their relatively moderate policy platform has opened up space to the left of them for the Australian Greens and the so-called teal candidates, who basically want stiffer emission cuts and more integrity in politics. But while the Greens were doing all right in first preference polling, head-to-head -head polling before the election suggested that, despite a narrowing in the last few weeks, Labour enjoyed a solid five-point poll lead over the coalition going into the election. So it wasn't that much of a surprise when, on Sunday morning, Australian media outlets declared that Labour had beaten Scott Morrison's coalition. Realising that Anthony Albanese would be Australia's next Prime Minister, Scott Morrison accepted defeat and stepped down as leader of the Liberal Party. Now, we should say that we're writing this video on Monday morning, so not all of the votes have been counted. But with about 80% of all votes counted and 143 seats declared, it looks like Labour are on track to win a slight majority of about 77 seats, while the Coalition are looking at about 57 seats in the Parliament. Perhaps the biggest story of the night, though, was the success of the Teal Independents, who won at least five seats at the Coalition's expense. So what does this mean for Australia and the world? Well, the big policy implications is that there's a majority in the Australian Parliament in favour of more immediate action on climate change. Over the last few years, Australia has suffered terribly from extreme weather events and heat waves, but action on climate change has been hindered by the country's coal industry, which holds significant political weight. Scott Morrison's government dismantled Australia's emission trading scheme in 2014 and spent about 10 billion Australian dollars subsidising coal companies last year alone. This will presumably all change under Labour. Under its Powering Australia plan, Labour wants to reduce emissions by 43% by 2030, with renewables accounting for 80% of electricity generation and achieve net zero by 2050. The Greens and the Teals want even more immediate action. So if Labour can't quite squeeze a majority and instead need to rely on crossbench support, these climate goals could even be scaled up. As a final thing, this election also suggests that cost of living crises aren't good for centre-right, fiscally conservative governments. Sure, there were other reasons for the coalition's failure in this election, but it does look like fiscal rectitude doesn't play well with voters when they're tight in the pocket. You've likely heard us talk about Nebula before, but it's at its lowest price ever. So give me one minute to explain why you should care, and as always with TLDR, there's three points. Firstly, signing up to Nebula gives you a ton of additional TLDR content. We release some videos exclusively on Nebula. Those are full-length, proper videos and a super fun studio tour video. We also release longer versions of some videos. In fact, we release a longer version of our show, The Daily Briefing, on Nebula every single weekday. That's a lot more TLDR every day. Secondly, everything on Nebula is ad-free. That's not just TLDR, but all of your favourite creators like Wendover Productions, Real Life Law, Polymatter, Legal Eagle, and Half as Interesting. All this content is ad-free, so there'd be no mid-rolls and I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Thirdly, signing up and watching on Nebula really helps the channel. Here's the maths. TLDR viewers signing up to Nebula has significantly improved our ability to monetize our content, which has allowed us to begin employing more staff and investing in new technology to improve our content. You might not notice it yet, but you will soon, and signing up is so helpful. So you're convinced, right? Did I do it in a minute? Who knows, it's pre-recorded. Anyway, if you do want to sign up to Nebula, the cheapest way to do so is with the CuriosityStream Nebula Bundle deal. That way, signing up to CuriosityStream for the crazy low price of $11.59 a year gets you free access to Nebula. That's right, two streaming services for less than a dollar a month. And by the way, that crazy low price only lasts for this week. And CuriosityStream is awesome. It contains absolutely boatloads of high-quality documentaries on all kinds of topics I know TLDR viewers will love. So if you want both for $11.59 a year, this week only, then the link's down below. And if not, well, I can't say I haven't tried to convince you. Thanks for your support.